limestone. They're going to bring a group of three or four that's going to give the music, and I'll be bringing the message. If you have, anybody have a good sermon they want me to bring, you might want to let me know about it because I'm having trouble finding something to bring. But I'll find something along the line. I'll have to go 10 years back in, in my sermon file. I'll find something. But anyway, and we all bring food, finger food. And we'll supply that for fellowship at Bullshaw. So we can always time. do Zacchaeus. Huh? We can always do Zacchaeus. That's right. Yeah, always Zacchaeus. He can always stand by, yeah. I might do that. I might just, you know, just preach a good revival sermon. See if we can get all them folks right. But anyway, I, I was going to say something bad, but I won't say it. All right. Tonight, I'm thinking, unless I decide to talk about the examples of people of prayer, and I haven't fully decided, remember that prayer meeting will be next Tuesday. Because there will be a lot of people cooking and traveling on that Wednesday for Thanksgiving. So Tuesday is our regular time next week. And I haven't decided whether I'm going to be talking about people of prayer or not. If I do not, then tonight is the final lesson on prayer. And it's very, very important. I really believe that tonight's message is, is better than all the other ones combined. It's very practical. But if you really want to take notes, you want to pay attention to what we talk about tonight because it really centers around our prayer life. Tonight's lesson is on the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Uh, actually, it's called, the book is titled Power Through Prayer. And I'll go ahead and tell you that most of E.M. Bound's notes is geared toward preachers and ministers. However, I've broken this down to relate to the layman too. I think you get something good out of it. Now, let's not make any bones about it. The reason that we pray is to receive answers, okay? Basically, that's what we do. We get the gift. The Pavlov theory, you know, instant gratification is what our motivation is. We pray because we want something, okay? That's the kind of way we are built. However, the ultimate goal for prayer is to strengthen us in our Christian walk. And everybody needs that. If I were to go around the room or go around anywhere and just ask on a scale of 1 to 10, how strong of a Christian do you feel you are? Generally speaking, more than half of the people would say, I'm a five or a six, or we're on the weak end. Nobody really feels strong in their Christian faith, okay? They don't feel like they can take on the devil. They don't feel like they can take on the world. However, there's something to be said about our prayer life that relates directly to our Christian walk. Many times, the reason we do not get answers is simply because we do not persevere, okay? There has to be the perseverance of God's people to continue with fervent, earnest prayer in order to receive something from God. Use the analogy of a football game, okay? A football game is 60 minutes broken into four quarters. You and I know that starting out of the game, everybody is full of adrenaline, and the first quarter is really more emotion than it is anything else. But as the game goes on, by the time that you get to the fourth quarter, everyone who has been playing every down is usually physically fatigued down. So what gets them over the hump? Well, they push through because they have the mentality to overcome the physical limitless. Now, why do I say that? No matter how weak of a Christian you feel you are or how weak of a prayer life you feel you are have, you should persevere and you should push on through the fourth quarter. Even when you are not physically strong enough to persevere, do like the football players. Continue to go. Push on to the fourth quarter and push on to the end of the game because that is going to add power to your Christian walk. So think about that as you pray. And I'm just tired of praying about this. 
my body's weak, I'm tired, you know, I just, I just want to re relax, relax and rest. Do not do it. Persevere to the end. Remember the illustration that we used with Jesus. His disciples were in the temptation mode too. They just didn't realize it, especially Peter. But what did they do? They physically gave out and they slipped while Jesus prayed. And that has to be a lesson for every one of us as we live our lives for the Lord. So anyway, five points and we'll be through tonight. Okay? I don't think it'll take a lot of time. When we're saved, okay, the term, the first point is we're stronger together. Stronger together. All right, we're talking about the power of prayer now. When you and I are saved, we become part of the ecclesia, okay? That's the Greek word for the body of believers. And as far as the Baptist goes, it's a body of baptized believers, okay? And, our, uh, and, there, and we're, we're growing in the Lord, but there's many obstacles to our growth. As individuals, as children. So what we do is we come together, we gather together because there's strength in numbers. Think of it like this. If you have a thread, a single thread that you sew with, you know you can just about break that thread in two without any effort at all. But if you take 100 of those threads and you weave them together, no longer do you have a thread, what do you have? A cord or a rope. A rope, okay? What the body of Christ needs is people that pray together about the same thing, okay? Ian Bounds said this. He said, you know, it takes 20 years to build a sermon. Now, what did he mean? Well, he meant this. You can never separate the message from the character of the person. That can also be said about everybody's prayer life. It takes 20 years to get a prayer through because you can never separate the character of the person that's doing the prayer. We all live our lives. We grow. We influence people. And we are influenced by others. That's just the way life is. So when I say that, I believe the Bible teaches here, and I think he's making the point, we need praying people, that there's a direct connection to people's prayer lives with their attendance to the house of God. Uh, consider this for a minute. On a given week, you might have two, you might have four hours of people that come to the house of God. Okay? We hope we have some influence on them. But then as you go out into the world and they go to school, well, they're going to be at school 30, maybe 36 hours a week. And you know that the school is going to have a tremendous influence on whatever the, t uh, the children learn. But when they go home, guess what? They're there for 136 hours. So the home has a bigger influence on developing their character than the church does. So that's why it's always important never to miss church on any given level unless you're providential hindered. Be here. Be a praying Christian. And pray for the church, pray for the preacher, and that's one thing he emphasizes over and over again. As you pray for the preacher, your prayers will find strength and your prayers will find answers because you pray for something spiritual. Always remember what we say. The Christian life is a life of redemption. And prayers are made to be built around redemption, right? Redemption is a purpose and a goal. And so we come together, we don't miss an opportunity to lift up the Lord and to pray together about whatever needs that we feel lay before the Lord. Any questions on that? Amen. I don't know, I really too much about prayer. I can't remember who said that. But uh, this was a reliable person. And he says that when you come in church, it's the best place to pray. Because you're assuming that most of the people there are saved, yeah. and so you have a greater gathering of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. You have a greater gathering, and the Holy Spirit is, is, is present, He's flowing through us, and this place is set aside just as the Old Testament place was as a place of prayer. So there's no place that compares to church prayer. 
even in the Chronicles message about revival, prayer in the house of God. And that goes back to my argument the other week, you know, should the house of God be open at all times? There was a time when the doors were not locked. And maybe that's a lack of faith on church's people. But the lights ought to be on and the doors ought to be open. Do you know in the big cities they open the churches? Don't you think they have vandalism? Don't you think they have homeless people that come and spend the night in the church? But a lot of the churches will not lock their doors. And I think that is a big indication of faith. Uh, now, we don't do it. I mean, you know, we lock out. We don't want nothing stolen. But sometimes I think that shows the lack of faith, the lack of power of prayer that we have because we don't allow the church to become a place of prayer for all people. And that means sinners. That means anybody that wants to get up in the middle of the night or drive it around, they would just want to come in and sit and pray. What do you think about that? Can't do that no more? Can't? I don't think we have to be in church in order to be in prayer. True, true, but just like I said, there's, there's, there's power in numbers. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Except that you're you you you're able to close the world out, maybe. But that might be a problem. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a psychological effect to coming into a church acknowledging that the altar is there, what it stands for. Um, and, and what the church stands for. I, I mean, you know, in my case, for example, in order for me to feel good about my prayer, I have to be mentally and, and, and spiritually prepared. Right. And I think the atmosphere can have a lot to do with that. I agree. Um, praying in the church. If you've been around the church for a long time, sometimes you can visualize people, and I've heard Miss Georgianne talk about it, uh, people who have sat in these pews and years ago and, and, you know, were active leaders in the church, were prayer warriors. Uh, like Miss Bell, she was a tremendous prayer warrior. She believed in the power of prayer. Uh, but she no longer walks the halls of these churches. She's gone to her heavenly reward. But at one time she sits, and sometimes I think it, the, it's not it's not the best word, but the ghostly presence of them, you know, the, the cloud of witnesses that witnesses in heaven, and we're in the house of God. Maybe that cloud of witnesses of the people of the church is there with us as we pray. And you know, all the people that's out there that once lived here, and so I kind of think that enhances the prayer. All right, anything else? All right, let's move on. We have to remember that our sufficiency is God, okay? Uh, somebody said this one time by the preacher. said the most awful, reverent, fearful thing about him was the was, was the way that he prayed, okay? Now, why did they say that about this particular preacher? Well, the reason they said it is because words do have an impact on those that we pray around. That means that as children of God, we are supposed to be praying people. And me or anybody that sits in the pews should never be afraid to call a prayer meeting anytime. Okay? I mean, if somebody at work and said, you know, I've got some problems, I need some prayer, so let's come over here in the corner and let's pray. Uh, in the hospital room, in the mortuary, anywhere in the church halls. When people ask you on the telephone, say, listen, I need some prayer. Well, let's just have a prayer meeting right now. There's something to be said about praying out loud. Now, I know, you know, folks argue about this all the time, about when you go to whisper a prayer and all like that. But you pray with conviction and actually, in a sense, you preach through your prayers, through the words that you say over and over again. And every believer should have that sense of conviction in them that I'm a prayer, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a prayer person, and I will pray in the schoolroom, I will pray in the classroom, I will pray in the, in the business, I will pray anywhere in the grocery store, I'll pray on the streets, I'll pray over the telephone. 
I will be a praying person because I will use my words to have an influence on whoever I'm praying to. And that means that as we pray, we should not be afraid to pray the truth. John said, speak the truth in love. So maybe he's talking about praying the truth in love. But never get to the place that you are not willing to call a prayer meeting any time. And believe in your heart that the God of all heaven will anoint you and give you exactly the words that you need to say. What do you think about that? Thirdly, the letter kills. Okay? This is real important. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We understand that. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 8. Okay? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. When it frosts, as it's going to do tonight, maybe tomorrow, okay? The frost has a purpose in nature. The purpose of the frost is to kill everything. <laughs> okay? The freeze is to kill everything, okay? To kill the bugs, kill the grass so we don't have to cut it, kill the tree, just make everything fall off as we get toward winter, okay? Our, fever, our prayers should always be fervent. In other words, they should not be cold. Now, what are you talking about, Christian? All right, understand what I'm saying. I'm not being critical. I'm just making a statement. In the 46 years that I have been a pastor, I have heard a lot of prayers from a lot of people, okay, in a lot of churches. There are some people that when you call on them to pray, you know every word they're going to say. You could actually pray it before they pray it. Now, it doesn't matter what the setting is. It could be in the pulpit. It could be at the hospital. It could be down in the dining room. It could be anywhere. That's what he's talking about when he says the letter kills. Prayers are not just repetitious words, okay? They have no effect. Because it is up to the person that's praying to have enough severity in them that when you pray, you take the prayer to fit the place and the time. Okay? There are different prayers for the church. There are different prayers for the hospital room. There are different prayers for the cemetery. Because we're all expecting different results from those prayers. When we pray in the church, we're not necessarily praying for anybody's physical healing here. We're praying for the Spirit of God to touch those hearts that need to be touched. Those that are closest to eternity. Those that are backslidden from God. That's what we're praying for here. When we get in the hospital room and we're sitting over somebody that's sick. Lord God, I pray that you would bless these words. And I pray, dear God, that you'll save everybody in this room. Well, there ain't one person in the room. Maybe two. You have to change up your prayers and you have to pray for others. Cold prayers does not work. Now, what do you think about that? We listened a little bit in the old church. Yes. One Wednesday night, it was so cold that we all got up in the choir. Really? Yeah. And Susan was up there with me and we called on poor George likes to pray. Okay. Well, he prayed, and then the preacher forgot he had asked him to pray, and we asked him again. <laughs> and Susan said, while he was there, he's already said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you get the point. Yeah. The letter kills. Cold prayers do not amount to much. They have to be feathered. Okay. <laughs> and too much wordiness will dampen the spirits of everybody that listen to it. Now, you know what I'm talking about. I'm, not, I'm trying to be kind, but I'm telling the truth in love, right? Think about that. All right, fourthly, there's two things that need to be avoided, okay? Again, prayer is all about the redemption. It's all about what Jesus was about, redeeming the world, and that's what our prayer life should be about, the redeeming of souls, and, and giving the Christian strength to be better witnesses as they go out in the world to help redeem souls, okay? There are two extremes that we need to avoid, okay? These are important. 
They're very practical, but they're important. First of all, when we pray, it's true we're talking to God. Okay? But we are overheard by men. Okay? So what does that mean? Your prayers must be directed. It's all right to call names because that lets them know that we're, we have those names in our mind. Just call names, whether it's two or three or four or five. If you have to write them down, that's okay. But as you pray, you're overheard by men, and so as these people listening to even the person that you're praying for, call their name, pray for them by name, so God knows exactly who you're talking about. There are different circumstances, and you should pray for those circumstances, whatever it is. And never be afraid to ask that person, do you have a special need that you would like me to pray for as we pray? You'd be surprised. Many times they will. Uh, there's been times when somebody said, well, you know, I'm not on speaking terms with my daughter. I need you to pray for that situation. And I said, thank you. We will pray about that. Somebody is sick. You need to pray for that person's healing. And you call their name because you're making it personal and you're Although you're talking to God and God knows everybody, it reinforces the people that you pray with or pray around that you are earnest about what you're saying and you mean what you say by calling these names. Okay? Second, we have to be careful not to make prayer a byproduct of our lives. Now, Think of soup, okay? You like my soup? You like homemade soup? My homemade vegetable soup? All right, you put all the ingredients in there, okay? You stir them up. Then what we do is we throw a little season or a little salt in there to give it some flavor. Prayer is not the season. Prayer is not the salt that goes on the soup. Prayer is the soup because prayer is the nutrients and that's what's in the soup, the nutrients. The salt doesn't give you anything, just dries your blood up. Don't do a thing. Might run your blood pressure up. It doesn't have any nutrient whatsoever. The nutrient is in the soup. And our prayer life is the soup. It is the nutrient that gives us the ability to do anything else that we want to do. Let me give you two examples. <clears throat> we use the wrong methods when we teach people to pray. I'm guilty, okay? So I ain't throwing no rocks at you. Get around the table. You want the children and the grandchildren. And the first thing to do is, let's say the blessing. Wrong. The children are getting ready to pray now. Say your prayers when you go to sleep at night. Wrong. We're not interested in teaching people to say blessings. We're not interested in teaching people to say prayers. What we're interested in is getting them to have a conversation with a real life person. And that person happens to be God. A child of God does not do evil. We do not say our prayers. We fervently have a conversation. And by the way, it is a human conversation because that's what we are. And we talk to God just like we would talk to anybody else. He already knows them, but we tell him our hurts, our fears, our trials, our troubles, our hates, our dislikes. Lord God, I just need you to do something in my life because of the way I feel about this person. Lord God, you need to do something with me. You need to show me and change my attitude, Lord. It just ain't right. Have a human conversation with God. Now, that's a whole lot beyond teaching somebody to say their prayers or say their blessings, right? I love the pattern that I found a few years back in Acts, okay? An acronym of the word Acts gives you an idea of exactly what it means to have a fervent prayer life and not just to say your blessing or say your prayers or whatever. The A represents acknowledging God. Well, God, I thank you for all you are. I praise you, dear God, for your love and mercy. I just praise you for Jesus and anything else that comes to your mind. The second is the C. That's confession of sin. Well, we know that the Bible teaches we can't give anything from God until we confess our sin. So after we are through acknowledging God, we confess our sin. Then we come to the T. 
The T is the thanksgiving. We start thanking God for all that he's done in our lives, all the things of the past. Thank you, Lord, for healthy children. Thank you for the blessings of a home, food on my table. Thank you for a good church. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of good revival. Thank you, Lord, for friends. Just thank God for everything that comes to your mind. And then, and only then, you add supplications. And supplication just means making your wants and wishes known to God. But you don't do that you don't do that until you have acknowledged God, confessed your sin, and thanked Him. And then you get down to the nitty-gritty of prayers. Now that's the way to teach people to pray. That's the way to teach children to pray. That's not just saying your prayer tonight. That's not just saying your blessing. Okay? Prayer is essential. Okay? We talk about the value of prayer. But we have to always remember something. Nothing gets done until the Holy Ghost shows up. When the believers, the book of Acts, they, I got a lot for you to do. I want you to go save the world. But you got to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, as believers, we're saved. One day we ask Christ into our life, and at that moment we believe we were born again by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, the living God, took up residence in the human that's why he's with us as we come to the house of God. We gather, we can sense his power and his presence. He's here, okay? And as he comes, he's ready to take control of our lives. Lord, just take control of me. You take it, uh, control of my prayer life. Let my prayer life be in touch with you. Now, we talked about verbal prayer. So that means we depend on God. If we got the Spirit of God in, we can depend on Him. Not only take control of my prayer life, Lord, but take control of my tongue. And let what I say be meaningful and powerful. Don't let it be repetitious, but let it be meaningful and powerful. And there's that word again, let it be fervent. Fervent means a deep felt conviction. Old fire prayer. And we'll close with this. You and I have both read books about people. We talked about one moment ago. Through all of Christian life, all Christian denominations, who, when they got to the place that they started praying, they admitted that they spoke in an unknown tongue. Now, you know how I feel about that. I think it's a learned language, okay? And I'm not going to take up that debate tonight, okay? But what I am going to tell you is this. In our prayer life, there has to be a heavenly, a heavy dose of praising God in any language that you want to use. Praising God. I mean, just lifting holy hands and... Oh, God, thank you so much for saving me. Thank you, Lord, Lord, for what you've done and what you've given me. Thank you for your blessing. Just praising God for who he is. And I want to close with that. I want to read to you Psalm 150. And think about it. In your prayer life, it has to be heavily dosed with praising God. I don't care what language you do it in, whether you want to do it in Greek or whether you want to do it in English. Heavy dose of praising God in your prayer life. Start that tonight and use it religiously. Psalm 150 sums it up pretty good. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty act. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him on the high sounded cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, incorporate that in your personal prayer life and find out what happens. Any comments or questions? Tell me, how about that? Fasting is not mentioned in E.M. Bell's books except in a byproduct. And he talks about that the disciples did it and that, that Christians should practice it too. But he does not give any 
distinct uh, guidance for fasting. Uh, most Christians don't fast. I have fasted my whole life. I fast Sunday morning before I get in the pulpit. But fasting is good for anybody to do on a regular basis, whether they fast one meal or whether they fast the whole day. But you only fast when there's something that you really want from God. An answer to prayer. Said, Lord, I want this prayer answered by 12 o'clock today. I'm going to fast until that hour and let me hear an answer. So prayer should be, a, fasting should be a part of our prayer life of denying ourselves physical nutrients, uh, nutrients in order to get something from God. But it shouldn't be done haphazard. It shouldn't be done just for the sake of, well, I'm going to fast, you know. It should be done for a purpose that you want something specific from God. Any comments on that or questions? Is it wrong to put out a fleece? Good question. Uh, I believe it's wrong to put out a fleece. However, we have the example of the Bible, you know, Gideon making the fleece before God. No, what, 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 what Gideon? Who did the fleece? I can't remember. I, I don't remember. We'll have to Google that. Somebody, somebody in Bible laid the police out for me. Huh? You sure we get in? Okay, all right. I'll try first time. Okay. But anyway, laying the police before the Lord is uh, something that I do not believe in. The reason I don't believe in is because I think the Bible talks about tempting God and trying God. I think that's something. Now, you may have a different opinion about that. If you do that, that's fine. We'll, we'll just disagree on that. But in my opinion, laying the police for the Lord is just kind of like tempting or trying to go. What do you think? I kind of agree with the Lord. Thoughts. Yeah. Anybody else have an opinion?
pray for the inhabitants of heaven tonight and while we're ready, we'll pray for Miss Anne. Anne is up to receive visitors. You'd like to go by. I think she has a lady sitting with her, Miss Betty, a real cordial lady. You can just go in and speak, and Anne is, uh, uh, she has all of her faculties, and she'd be glad to carry on a conversation with you if you'd like to go by and see her. Okay. I'm sure she'd uh, love to forget this to her. Miss Doris, she's doing well, but she's still a sick lady, so let's continue to pray for Miss Doris. Doris okay. Pray for, as we prepare for our trip to West Virginia. Everything's going to be fast and furious from this moment on. It always picks up right before Thanksgiving, and we have our stuff coming in on a daily basis. We just pray that the Lord will bless our trips and our efforts and, and uh, everything connected with it. And while I'm thinking about it, we're going to this dot. I need that list passed around Sunday of the things that we need to fill in the square boxes. Okay? If you get that typed up, I know it's in the office back there, so I can make sure it gets passed around. Okay. All right, anything else? Anybody else needs our prayers? All right, we'll continue to pray for our shut-ins. Uh, remember those that are uh, in the nursing homes. Or, or is the Sunday school class doing anything for them this year? Ms. Judy? We haven't really talked about it. Huh? We haven't talked about it. We okay. need to. Okay. All right. Remember them if you would. Ms. Tommy Sue, Ms. Denise Wells, Ms. Betty Shingler, Ms. Mildred Cornelius, Ms. Millie Gill, Ms. Carolyn Griggers, Lonnie McNeely, John Oak Park, Aunt Abbott, and Kermit Hewitt, and Billy Price. Remember our military personnel, especially Christian Overly, he's been deployed overseas. Pray for him. Uh, pray for Gabriel Bennett. Pray for Mason McGrew. Mason is in Colorado Springs and, and Gabriel is in Hawaii right now. Pray for our members, Burton and Wendell Loss. Pray for the uh, deacons as they prepare to get something going as far as a uh, uh, deliberate interim to fill in after I leave. Everything is being progressed toward that point, and they will be in talking to you on a basis every Sunday, letting you know exactly what's going to be on. But we have a good meeting Sunday night with a uh, gentleman from the convention that's going to help find a, 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 an interim to come in and fill the board for about six or nine months uh, to help the church go forward and find someone. And I think it's really important that this interim become a part of the process. So pray about that and you'll hear more about that on Sunday. The convention has just met. We've elected a new president of uh, Reverend Eric Church, new president of Southern Baptist, South Carolina Baptist Convention. He is the pastor of the uh, First Baptist Church in Columbia. Uh, <clears throat> no other items really for <coughs> issue except for the late of the president. Pastor, you a list of the items we still need. I want that list that was turned in by me. It should be back there on the desk. I need it copied up so we can go ahead and fill these boxes up and get them back. We don't need extra stuff for all, we just need those items. Right and there's something missing from about 10 of them. Okay. Well, so now, see. Right, one, rice is not listed until December 4th. There's some items that correct, we haven't correct, hit Correct, but all the other stuff needs to be going in wrong. Yeah, we can get right there, no problem. We can get that. But the stuff up to December 4th, which will be this Sunday, and we'll have one more Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think we got crackers this Sunday and rice. Oh, we got cookies last Sunday, got crackers this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Are we ready to pray? Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to pray. And I pray, dear God, that we as Christians will grow in our prayer life, we'll become more bold in our prayer life, and we'll understand, Lord, exactly what prayer is and what it's about. We praise you tonight, Lord, for who you are and all that you've done in our lives. We praise you, dear God, for the ways that you have blessed us, sustained us through everything. 
We praise you for Providence Church and we praise you for its people. We praise you, Lord, not for only the things you have done, dear God, but the things you're going to do. And tonight we confess that we are sinful people. And you told us that if we would confess, Lord, you would cleanse us, that nothing would hinder our prayers. So, Father, remove the sin of our lives tonight, that nothing would hinder the things that we ask for on behalf of others. Tonight, Lord, we thank you for the season. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you, Lord, for everything that's surrounding We thank you for all the things that are in place, Lord, for the children, the youth, and the adults as they prepare, Father, to celebrate life. We thank you for the service coming Sunday night and ask for your uh, blessing to rest upon us. Now, Lord, we lift up certain people to you tonight. We have a prayer list, Lord, that remains long. We have our military personnel on it. We have our shut-ins. We have our members motivated to win the loss. We have the decision, Lord, that the church is going to have to make, Father, in a couple of months. And we ask, Father, that your hand of mercy rest upon them. We pray, Father, for those who have passed on this past year. And for them, we ask your ministry, Lord, to the family. We pray, Father, for those who are really sick. We have a church family that has a lot of needs. We have children in our congregation that's never accepted you as Lord and Savior of their life. And tonight, Lord, we pray especially for these particular people. We pray for our West Virginia mission and all those that will go, keep them safe, prepare them. Pray for Sister Doris and her family. We pray for the inhabitant family. We lift up Anne to you and ask your hand of mercy to rest upon her. Lord, a special prayer tonight for Brother Stephen. I ask you, Lord, to help him in his situation, Father. Heal him according to your divine will. And may your grace be sufficient, Father, in his suffering in this hour. Just keep him in your care, relieve the fever, and give the doctors and nurses wisdom and help the medicine to do its thing. In the name of Jesus, we offer this prayer. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank y'all for your time tonight. I think we're going to sing a little bit.